hi everybody and welcome to the fourth lecture um, in my course on introduction to quantum theory and quantum technologies. So um, in the last uh, few weeks, well, I've given you first a grand overview of uh, quantum theory and um, leading up to the recent developments. And uh, since uh, the last lecture, third lecture, uh, we've been just going through some preliminary uh, mathematical tools that we'll need for quantum theory. And so this is sort of the second part of that. Um, the, the topic that we covered last week was complex numbers, but uh, this week what I'd like to go through is uh, linear algebra. So um, uh, as uh, the way that I was teaching the uh, last lecture, um, what I'm basically going to do is just tell you sort of the uh, essential parts of uh, what you actually really need for quantum mechanics. I'm not really going to go into a lot of the real sort of mathematical um, kind of derivations and proofs and things like this, um, because actually you don't really need it for quantum theory. You just need to know uh, some certain rules and um, just basically how to use these kinds of uh, this kind of mathematics. So um, this is sort of going to be sort of a physicist's uh, interpretation of uh, how you um, uh, of basically the mathematics that you need for quantum theory. Okay, so um, so linear algebra is uh, basically a theory of uh, vectors. So what we know, we're probably already familiar with uh, vectors because um, they come up in all kinds of different contexts, but uh, linear algebra is sort of more formally the kind of uh, theory of vectors, but also including uh, complex numbers. So this might be what you uh, may not be very familiar with because if you haven't done complex numbers, then of course uh, you wouldn't have um, seen vectors with uh, complex components. But um, really, uh, there, there's not too much uh, more really beyond the regular theory of vectors that you already know. So, so um, my kind of, in a nutshell, uh, definition of linear algebra might be something uh, where we generalize vector spaces to include uh, complex numbers and of course we uh, don't have to limit ourselves to uh, the three-dimensional world that we happen to live in. Um, these uh, could be um, in any kind of dimension. Um, in fact it's fairly straightforward to generalize you know this theory of vectors from three dimensions, this is the world that we live in, um, to uh, any number of dimensions. You basically just have more and more components. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. So um, that's really what linear algebra is. So the story is that if you know already something about vectors and combining that with what we learned last week on complex numbers, then uh, it's really just putting those two things together and uh, the fact that you have complex numbers involved actually doesn't really make anything so much more complicated. So don't, don't, uh, don't be scared. Um, in terms of uh, a textbook, um, if you wanted to read up on this topic to a greater detail, what I recommend is uh, have a look at the appendix of one of the recommended texts. This is uh, Introduction to Quantum Mechanics by uh, Griffiths. And uh, he uh, has a kind of uh, a introduction again to linear algebra and basically at the level that we really need to know for, for quantum mechanics. So just all the bits that you need and nothing too much more. So um, have a look at that if you want to um, you know, look through a sort of a textbook and, and learn this kind of material. Firstly, we should define what actually uh, a vector is. So 
Um, as you probably already very familiar with, so vectors are quantities that have a, a magnitude and a direction. So um, here's an example of a vector. It starts at point A and ends at point B. So uh, there's a, a particular kind of direction associated with it. So this is why we normally denote it with like an arrow because there's a particular direction. And it also has a, a magnitude because there's um, a distance between this sort of A and B. So examples of uh, vectors that you might have in real life are things like electric fields, magnetic fields, forces, and uh, velocities, acceleration. And maybe the most common example that you might have is just um, a regular old kind of displacement. So what we can actually most easily imagine is that this is some kind of uh, kind of map here and um, a person is just walking from point A to point B and uh, he's starting here and ending here. This is why the direction is in this direction. Okay, so, um, so Vectors are just such uh, quantities. Uh, scalars, on the other hand, are things which do not have any direction, but they do have a magnitude, right? So the classic kind of example of a scalar are things like uh, energy. Uh, maybe another example would be like your, uh, uh, your mass. So, um, so how many kilograms you are, this is an example of something that there's no particular direction to your to your mass in your body, um, and, uh, and and likewise with energy, there's no particular direction uh, with energy. So um, these are kind of scalars, right? So um, we're actually going to use a, a kind of slightly unusual notation here, um, and you might you might be used to um, the particular notation, it's, it somehow uh, doesn't appear on my slide here, but um, maybe the most common notation that you've seen for vectors uh, is uh, something like this, where there's a arrow on the top of um, uh, this kind of uh, vector, right? So this is the alpha vector. Um, there's some other kind of notations that people use. For example, uh, you can use uh, like bold font for for vectors, and I think some people even do uh, a, like a twiddle. There are some other notations that people use uh, to denote vectors out there. This includes things like the bold font, so you might refer to the bold. Uh, you know, font of alpha, and that means that's a vector, or even there's like notation where there's like a little twiddle underneath the, the symbol, and that also means vector. So uh, we're actually going to introduce yet another kind of notation, and you might think, why am I introducing, um, you know, yet another different notation to introduce vectors? Um, we'll see that actually this notation really helps especially in the context of quantum mechanics, to describe um, certain kind of common operations that you need to do. And it really gives a more sort of intuitive um, kind of structure to uh, this kind of um, theory in terms of linear algebra. So, um, so bear with me that I'm gonna introduce yet another new notation, but uh, basically the notation that I will be using is that this thing here, where we have this sort of uh, straight line and angular bracket, uh, this is our notation for uh, a vector. So um, uh, you, that is basically the, the thing that kind of is like the equivalent of the arrow on the top of the uh, symbol. Now, sometimes people get a bit confused about, you know, so what does, you know, what do you put inside here? What's, what's the, what's the, um, what symbol uh, are you supposed to do that, uh, supposed to put in there? So um, uh, the answer is that it's, this is 
purely just a name. So uh, you, you don't have to call it alpha, you can call it uh, anything that you like. So I could call this vector Fred or Bob or Mary, or I could call it vector number one, vector number 500, or vector A, vector C. Um, that is just purely a name and I can just uh, choose that at will. So um, in a way, uh, this, this makes it a bit more flexible because uh, of course, uh, you could do something like with the arrow notation and write like Fred um, and then put an arrow on the top of Fred, but I think people would generally be uh, confused by that. But um, with this kind of notation, you can easily put such labels and sometimes people really do uh, things like that. Um, uh, label the vectors in, in different ways. Um, so just a sort of a sneak peek of where this is all heading. So what it will it, it will turn out is that actually this vector uh, eventually will describe the quantum state of the uh, of of the you know of the system that we're we're talking about. So uh, later we're going to be talking about things like qubits and you know the uh, kind of state of uh, quantum computer and uh, state of an atom, all these things are described by a vector. And so eventually you will see uh, a lot of notation like this. And, and basically that really means that the state of a particular quantum system is in some particular state, which you could you know, write an equation for, but um, uh, that that is basically the meaning of that, and uh, the most common choice. So here I've, I've, I've just written alpha, but the most common choice that you see for people regarding the quantum state is uh, using this Greek symbol psi. So this is totally uh, arbitrary. Sorry, this came pretty wobbly, but um, uh, totally arbitrary choice. But uh, this is why you see uh, this symbol psi so much when you're talking about quantum. Um, you know, the latest quantum startups, there's many called something psi, and this is basically because uh, psi is just such a common letter that's been chosen uh, to describe the quantum state. Now I'm going to talk to you a bit about what you can actually do with vectors. So there are various types of operations that you can do with vectors, such as adding them, uh, multiplying them, uh, performing like certain uh, operations on them uh, and basically for the for the rest of this lecture I'm going to be talking about all the different operations that you can do. So first one is um, addition so that's kind of the simplest and um, so we we write uh, addition we can add two vectors together and we can write that in this way where like alpha vector plus beta vector is equal to gamma vector. So what that really means in terms of uh, vectors uh, is something like this. Um, so imagine you have some starting point here and alpha vector takes you from this initial point to uh, some uh, point uh, at the end of the alpha vector there. And then if we want to add another vector to that, then what that means is that you um, you start from the end of the alpha vector and then you put the beta vector at the end and well you start the beta vector from the end of alpha vector and then you end up at uh, another sort of third point. So this vector gamma is the resultant vector of uh, the two vectors starting from uh, alpha and beta. And uh, we can, you know, a simple example of this would be like if again uh, this this is our map and we are like moving around somewhere. Um, you know, maybe you are going from uh, some some particular point in your city to somewhere slightly north, and then you come back down. Um, what this basically says is that, of course, if you uh, you can also go directly there, not this kind of you know roundabout route from uh, combining alpha and beta. We can also go directly from the initial point to the final point, and this gamma vector is like the more direct route from the start to finish. So um, that's 
basically what additional uh, vector addition means. Now we can work out some properties of vector addition and uh, the first one is uh, things like uh, the commutative nature of um, vectors and so uh, in mathematical language what this says is that alpha plus beta vectors are equal to beta plus alpha. Um, what that really means in terms of kind of you know real life is that you can basically uh, add the vectors in any order that you like and it doesn't make a difference. This is actually what this word commutative means. It generally means that you can do things in different orders and it doesn't make a difference. So certain types of things are commutative um, and, and adding vectors is one of them, but certain things are, are, are not, not commutative uh, so uh, kind of a very simple uh, you know, common example is um, if you actually rotate a ball in two different, two different, uh, uh, act along two different axes, then you actually do not actually get to the same point uh, if you interchange the order. So if you sort of turn a ball some number of degrees like this way, and then you, then you turn it uh, uh, along the sort of the North Pole, then you don't generally get the same, uh, you know, same effect of rotation. So rotation is actually something that's actually not commutative, uh, but something like walking around on a, on a flat plane like this is actually uh, commutative. So, um, so you can add the vectors in any order that you like. So this picture here kind of illustrates that. So uh, say your starting point here is, is uh, at this point and then you first actually move in the direction of beta and then you add alpha on the end of that, then basically what this equation is saying is that you end up at exactly the same point. So you, you can basically add these in, in any order that you like. Um, this is this kind of general idea that you can add them in any order uh, is also uh, what basically this statement means that addition is associated that what that basically means is that say you had three vectors but then you added them in uh, different orders so for example if you added beta and gamma first and then added that vector to alpha then you get exactly the same vector as if you added alpha and beta together and then added the result of that to gamma. And of course you could do that with alpha and gamma and add that to beta. So it really doesn't really matter how you group the vectors, you actually get exactly the same um, end result. Um, so that's this property of it being associative. Actually, you probably wouldn't use this so much in quantum mechanics, uh, but um, uh, well, yeah, so yeah, it depends on, yeah, no, uh, sometimes you actually do use it in quantum mechanics. Uh, so um, yeah, okay, I'll take that. Um, so another example, another property is that uh, there is such a thing as uh, that is called the zero vector. And what this basically means is obviously the zero vector is just something which uh, in terms of uh, the, these types of examples is just like a vector of zero length. So it's just like a point, so it's like a dot there. Okay, so um, uh, a zero vector, um, if you add that to any vector, then what it does is to just uh, return the original vector sort of unmodified. So it's just the uh, vector with, you know, it's got zero length, so you add it to the original vector and nothing happens. To it. So uh, we'll call the zero vector that um, in this notation, although uh, in quantum mechanics often sometimes this uh, different notation is uh, used. So um, yeah, so I'll, I'll let you know when we're using this kind of notation. Uh, 
Um, there is also such a thing which is the inverse vector. And in this case, uh, say our original vector is alpha, and say we uh, have this vector such that it gives the zero vector, then so you can, I think, easily guess that the uh, this minus alpha vector here is simply the vector which is going in exactly uh, the opposite direction to alpha. So if you add this alpha vector to this, uh, this vector which is going in the opposite direction, minus alpha, then you end up at exactly the initial point. And so the net result of that is uh, zero because um, you know, adding those two vectors cancels each other out. So example would be basically you go somewhere uh, on your map uh, and then you go exactly along the reverse direction um, uh, in a straight line um, and then that obviously cancels out your um, displacement. And so you end up with uh, zero, uh, a zero vector at the end. Next, uh, we can talk about scalar multiplication. So what this is, is uh, a lot like um, uh, the example which I like to think about is like putting something into a photocopier. And you know how there's the enlarge or reduce um, kind of setting. So, you know, you can make your document that you put in to the photocopier, say bigger by like 150% or smaller by like 70 percent and so uh, this is basically a similar kind of effect um, uh, where you can multiply a vector and uh, enlarge or reduce it. So um, how do we write this mathematically? Um, so we write this uh, in this way where here's our original vector, this is like the original that we're putting inside the photocopier and uh, this a here is like the factor that is you know that you're going to reduce or enlarge by so if we want to enlarge this then this a is a number that's like bigger than one so you know in photocopier speak if you wanted to uh, enlarge something by 150 percent then this a would be like the number 1.5 so 1.5 would enlarge it by you know, uh, 1.5 times, which is the uh, same as 150%. Uh, likewise, reducing by 70% would be uh, where this number would be uh, 0 0.7. So, so you can multiply a vector by some, uh, uh, some scalar number. And so notice that this thing here is, of course, a vector. But this a is actually just a, a pure number and uh, you just multiply the vector by it. So um, uh, you, you get like a new vector gamma after you multiply the vector by this factor of alpha. So here's an example. Here we've got uh, alpha, which is the original vector, and then we're gonna multiply it by some scalar, which looks around about two here. So A is two in this example. And so we end up with a vector which is twice as long. So, so that's basically the simplest example of scalar multiplication. Um, you can actually show that uh, this scalar multiplication is uh, distributive. So what that means is that uh, the order that you do your scalar multiplication when there's two vectors involved uh, doesn't really matter. So, for example, say you had two vectors, uh, alpha and beta, and then say you added them together first, you found like the resultant vector. So this is exactly like the, the last slide. So, you know, we, we started with, um, you know, alpha and beta, and then we end up with, uh, say, gamma here. And then after that, you do your sort of enlarging or reduction. Um, so in this case, uh, that is actually exactly the same as if you enlarged or reduced your uh, vectors individually and then added them together after that. So you always get exactly the same result 
and that is basically the content of uh, this this equation. Um, uh, in a slightly similar kind of way, um, if you add the uh, scalar factors together, and then you use that to uh, multiply that with the uh, with a vector, then you could also equally um, distribute out. So just basically do the usual kind of algebraic kind of you know, multiplying uh, out kind of step um, on the vectors uh, individually. So you you add the resultant of uh, enlarging or reducing alpha by a factor of a, and similarly for b. And then you add them together, that gives the same result as if you uh, just added the uh, scale factors together first. So you can, uh, basically the point of this is that a lot of your sort of regular algebraic rules that you do, that you use, so you know when you do things like just regular algebra where you, where you multiply out something like you know a plus b, uh, brackets uh, times by c plus d brackets and then you do you know you do your multiplication uh, and then you find all the different combinations add them together uh, you can basically use all those rules that you're used to and it still works uh, even when you're mixing scalars and uh, vectors together um, now uh, for the next one scalar multiplication is associative what this means is that you can do the uh, if you are going to like enlarge or reduce in in two steps. So the analogous thing here in the photocopy example would be so you have your original document, you put in the photocopier, and then you say okay enlarge by 150 percent. Okay, and then you take that outside of you know take the result of that. You got your new enlarged uh, picture from the photocopier. Then you put that in the photocopy machine again, and then you press reduce 50 percent okay and then you know so you've gone you've become bigger and then smaller so um, th this is basically exactly that uh, process so what that says is that so what I just described there is like if uh, beta was like uh, 1.5 and then alpha would be like 0.5 so you you'd, you'd gone out you enlarged it first and then you reduced it right um, what this is saying is that hey you don't need to do that you don't need to put on the photocopy machine twice what you could equally do is to work out what the effect of enlarging by uh 50 percent so 150 and then reducing 50 percent you can work that out and then just do that just once in the photocopier so if you work out like what 1.5 times 0 0.5 is uh work out that number and then just uh, enlarge or reduce the um, vector according to that then you get the same result well you know, in terms of the size of the vector so so you could uh, you can you can do that uh, in again sort of different uh, orderings uh, and it still gives the same answer um, what if if you multiply by zero so of course you know uh, a particular example of this scalar is zero. We're allowed to multiply by zero. So of course, if you multiply any number by zero, you just always get zero. So in the case of uh, multiplying this vector by zero, you actually get uh, not just zero, but you actually get the zero vector. So um, you know, if you it, you have to kind of view this as some kind of limit of you know how the vector is like. You know shrinking or being enlarged right so of course if you shrink the vector down to a zero then you actually got the zero vector rather than just the number zero so note that this is not just equal to zero it's a zero vector um, likewise you can multiply by one and this is a bit like the thing which we had in the previous slide of addition this is like the the case where you 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 do your scalar multiplication and then basically nothing happens to the vector. So in the case of addition, uh, adding the zero vector is a thing that just does nothing. In this case, the do nothing 
uh, operation is the uh, is basically multiplying by one. So if you multiply the the vector by a factor of one, then you just get your vector back. Um, now another another thing that you can do, of course, is to find the inverse of the vector. So remember we talked about this vector minus alpha, which uh, was basically like the vector which is pointing in exactly the opposite direction to the original vector here. So we can actually work out exactly what that vector is and okay, no big surprise here, but it's actually just a vector where the scalar multiplication factor is equal to minus one, right? So if you have your a to be, happens to be the number minus one, then you get this vector which is pointing in exactly the opposite direction. So actually this thing minus alpha, which we didn't really sort of, uh, I just wrote it down um, in the previous slide. Actually, you can explicitly write this as just minus alpha, it's just the same vector with a minus sign in front. Okay, so we can then get on to writing vectors uh, in terms of their uh, components. So um, this is actually probably what you are already uh, quite familiar with. So um, a vector is often somehow uh, synonymously written uh, in this way. So we have this vector a and then you have some kind of uh, coordinates that describe the vector. So uh, what this actually really means is that um, you have some kind of coordinate system. So you've already decided which way is, you know, say, you know, the x-axis and which way is the y-axis. And assuming that particular coordinate system, then the vector is, corresponds to uh, uh, basically the coordinate of the final point of that vector. So if we've got this initial vector alpha here, we place it at the origin. Of course, that will take us from the origin to some place. Now, the, the coordinates of that point um, are is basically written like this uh, in this two-dimensional example. Uh, it's like A1, A2. These are just uh, two scalar numbers and they somehow uh, also describe vectors. So actually I've written that these are sort of equal. Actually it's not really strictly uh, sort of equal but they are kind of um, you know sort of they contain the equivalent amount of information. So I've taken a kind of a loose uh, approach in sort of uh, writing that these are sort of equal to each other. They're not, this this thing is really not really a vector, it's just kind of a list of numbers that kind of give the same information of the vector. The vector itself you would uh, write in still in terms of this. So um, uh, as I was kind of uh, alluding, um, this thing here, the which are the coordinates of this final point. This is obviously uh, kind of dependent upon what coordinates that you choose. So um, this is basically like uh, exactly the same situation where say, you, you know, you have a map and you're saying that, you know, uh, you want to move from point A to point B. Um, and essentially what you could do is you, you could say, okay, move east by you know, one degree and uh, move north by two degrees, and then you know, that will get you to the final destination. So um, uh, we are so used to sort of, you know, having this kind of common coordinate system that east and, you know, east, west, south and north, that we assume that that's, it's kind of a completely arbitrary uh, kind of convention, uh, we could equally have chosen, you know, the axes to be pointing the opposite direction. We could have said east is actually this way and west is that way, south is, well, we could even say east is up, west is down. Um, and uh, so long that we all agree on the same convention, then uh, everything is good, right? But um, uh, it, as soon as you have a different convention, of course, uh, physically you are going from point A to point B, so that's sort of an immutable fact of 
kind of nature of what you're doing. Uh, what convention that you use to describe this is, this is kind of a human kind of concept and it's completely up to uh, whatever convention that you choose. So what, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, even though the vector has a sort of a you know strict sense of reality, this uh, representation in terms of the coordinates is really dependent upon what coordinate that you use. So, for example, I could equally choose some coordinates here, which are like maybe even rotated by some angle, and then in that rotated coordinate system, uh, these numbers here would be completely different because, of course, you know your coordinate system is completely different. So um, uh, the coordinates are really uh, dependent upon, sorry, the, the, when you write these uh, in, in the vector in terms of these um, uh, components, then it's dependent always upon uh, what uh, axes you choose, or another way to say that is like what basis that you choose. So, so first, uh, essentially, when you are writing something uh, like this, what you need to do is you say, okay, first, what is our um, uh, coordinate choice that we're going to do? So this is uh, basically a particular kind of basis set. So basis is uh, something basically like a, a coordinate uh, system. So it, it's basically your elementary vectors which you can construct any other vector out of and what I mean by that is so for example we have this uh, vector alpha now um, here's our coordinates so here's like something along x and here's something along y now let's choose the like these so-called unit vectors which are the vectors which are pointing just exactly along the coordinate system that we just chose Okay, so I'm going to call them E1 and E2. Now, we know that we can actually uh, multiply these unit vectors by some number, a bit like this. So we can multiply this E1 by some number A1. So this will produce some sort of magnified version of E1. Uh, we can also make a magnified version of E2. We can just like extend this. And then now we can just like add those two things together. And as I've sort of uh, alluded to here, we can actually make this vector alpha just using, uh, by multiplying these uh, basis vectors by uh, suitable factors and then adding them together. So we, we can always make any vector uh, in this way. And so this was just a two dimensional example that I drew here. Um, uh, but of course, we can do this in any number of dimensions. So three dimensions would be something poking out of the page, or even uh, you, you can no longer visualize it in four or higher dimensions because you know we live in a three-dimensional world. But um, mathematically, it's a, you know no problem to really uh, generalize this to even more, more and more dimensions. So we know that we can write uh, this vector. We can decompose it in terms of these basis vectors and uh, by adding them uh, with suitable scalar multiples we can construct any vector right? and what this thing here is is what that actually is are basically just like what are these scalar factors that we had to multiply uh, these basis vectors uh, in order to reconstruct this vector so this is just basically a list of numbers and it uh, summarizes basically what that vector is but only in this particular coordinate system so as I've sort of emphasized if you have a different coordinate system then you'd have a totally different set of numbers so there's a kind of an implicit uh, dependence here on the actual uh, basis choice okay um, now uh, what happens when we do some of the things that we were talking about in the previous slide, um, given uh, this type of representation. So, so we're gonna sort of say that this vector here can be sort of associated with this bunch of numbers, uh, A1 to AN. Now, what if we add two vectors together? 
what happens to uh, these numbers. These are the, the, the components, right? So the, the numbers here are the components. <coughs> so um, what happens is actually something pretty simple. Uh, in fact, you can, you know, this is probably pretty obvious because you're probably even more used to dealing with vectors written in this format. Um, so when you add two vectors, uh, the actually, uh, what happens to the components is that all the components also add. So you can work out why uh, this is so by taking two vectors here. So say you had um, alpha and beta. And so if you add these two vectors, then of course you end up at uh, with this final vector in this way. But say you look at uh, what happens to the components of E1. Well, the component uh, along E1 for alpha is just uh, this vector here, and the component of beta along this direction is here. So, of course, if you add the x component, so if you just only look at the x direction of this uh, final vector, then, of course, uh, the amount that you move in this horizontal direction has to be equal regardless of whether you whether you take these, this final vector here, which we were calling gamma before, um, or we look at the components individually, and this one would be A1, and this one would be uh, B1, and, uh, and, and they, they would give the same result. So that's, that's the argument for the, for the X component. Now uh, you would get something similar for the y components uh, if you sort of repeated that for the different axes. Um, so this is how the uh, addition part uh, works in terms of components. Now, what about the scalar multiplication? Well, if you uh, multiply the vector by some scalar, then what happens is that uh, all the components also get kind of multiplied out here too. So um, this is basically the idea that if, you know, again, the photocopy example, if you are expanding your vector by, uh, say, 150%, then actually anything in the x, x direction is also bigger by 150%. Anything in the y direction is also bigger by 150%. And if there's more di different, you know, more dimensions, then they would also be expanded by 150%. So this is basically the statement of that. Um, the null vector is uh, basically the vector that is, you know, the zero vector. So you add it to anything, you get the same result. So obviously the uh, the vector corresponding to that is just some like some dot there, uh, and uh, that has like a, a length of zero. So all these components have to have zero. Uh, finally, the inverse vector is like the vector we already worked out that it's actually this is actually equal to minus uh, alpha. And so if you just use basically this property here, where C is equal to minus one, then you basically can show that the uh, components are also just multiplied by a factor of uh, minus one. So, uh, okay, and the basis, I think I've already talked about that uh, you can construct any vector uh, out of that, uh, out of the set of basis uh, uh, vectors. Um, um, one thing which I didn't uh, quite talk about is um, uh, how whether these uh, basis vectors uh, should be uh, orthogonal to each other. Um, so generally in quantum mechanics, we, uh, we can actually do both, uh, but the simplest case is we take each of these uh, vectors to be orthogonal, like right angles to each other, and they also all have a length of one. So let's just do a little bit of practice on uh, adding and uh, subtracting vectors. So for example, suppose the question was uh, you need to add these two vectors, alpha plus two times beta vector, and uh, we have two vectors like this. So um, in this case, uh, the way that I would do it is uh, something like this. So, um, so this, this first one, 
So I'm just going to write it here. So the first one is just the alpha vector itself. So let's write this as uh, E1 plus uh, I of E2. Okay. And these have uh, complex components. And so uh, we, we should you know, use what we've learned in the last lecture when we are going to be adding complex numbers. So here we, we want to do uh, two times this vector, beta. So this is going to be two times one minus i of e1 plus we, we've got a factor of two here. It's also going to be on the e2 as well. Okay, and then we can collect all the terms here. Uh, we can also multiply this bit out. So on the E1, we've got two from, from, from over here. Uh, we've got another factor of two from multiplying this guy out. And we've got a minus two I uh, altogether. And so this is E1. Uh, for E2, we've got an I here and a two here. So this is just gonna be two plus I. And we can just do a little bit of simplification here. And so the, this one will be 4 minus 2i on E1. And 2 plus i on uh, E2. Okay, so that's, that's how we do uh, that one. Um, you could equally do all this stuff in terms of uh, components. So another way to really write this, if you like, is like in terms of a vector like this. This is 2i. And this vector would be like 1 minus i1. And then doing it with components, you would basically say, so instead of uh, what I did there, um, I would say, uh, First, we take this vector 2i uh, and then plus 2 times 1 minus i and 1. And then I won't go through the steps again, but this would uh, also just give 4 uh, minus 2i and this would give uh, 2 plus i. Okay, so you could do it like that if you like. It's basically exactly the same. Okay, um, now let's do the second example here. So this time we're doing uh, beta minus alpha. So um, uh, we can maybe we'll do it uh, using the component language this time because uh, you, just so that you can see how that works. So um, let's write the definitions of beta and alpha in terms of the components here. And what we're going to do is subtract this one from alpha, which is 2 and i. And notice here that, of course, when I write the components, this, this uh, top one is the, the, um, uh, the component for E1 vector, and the bottom one is the component for E2. Okay, so we just have to do this kind of subtraction here. So uh, 1 minus 2, these are the real parts of the complex numbers. This is going to be equal to minus 1. The complex part of it is left alone, so that's still minus 1, minus i rather. Uh, and the bottom is also 1 minus i. Okay, and, uh, and that, that's pretty much uh, the simplest you, you can write that. Now let's talk a little bit about something that you may not have uh, come across. And uh, if you're just doing sort of vectors uh, only involving um, you know, regular real numbers. So this is the idea of the uh, conjugate vector. Okay, so we can first define the conjugate vector, which is this guy. And this is something very similar to the vector alpha, but it's actually a kind of, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, Kind of pair which uh, lives actually in a completely different sort of space. Um, so it, you have to think of these things as sort of dual versions of, of each other. Um, but 
how this is defined is so we introduce this uh, so-called conjugate vector as something that looks a lot like the regular vector, which the regular vector would be uh, you know, like this. The conjugate version would be uh, written uh, like this uh, in terms of the um, uh, uh, also these uh, conjugate versions of the uh, basis uh, vectors here. So each this uh, conjugate vector is actually made from its conjugate versions and um, and uh, it's again formed by a linear superposition or a linear sum uh, of multiplying these conjugate basis vectors by certain numbers like this, you know, a1, a2, and a n. And what are these stars on these? So if you remember, if you go back to the last lecture, then remember you could define the complex conjugate of a complex number by uh, just putting this star on it. So for example, if you have the number one plus two i, if I uh, take the star of that particular number, then basically what I do is just flip the sign of the part with the i. Okay, so the i just goes to minus i, and that's 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 the conjugate. Right? So that's just this is just a simple example. So if I started with the alpha vector, which contains components of a1, a2 up to a n, then this thing with the stars is the conjugate vector. And it's built from that. So, what, okay, so what is this kind of mysterious object that I'm introduced? Now, it might actually make a lot more sense when uh, you write this in terms of in the component notation, right? So, remember that we can also write the vector alpha in terms of these components, but actually we write it in terms of like a column vector, so something that's actually going, you know, sort of. Uh, you know, vertically like this, so we write it actually as a column. And you might think, why, why do we always bother with writing it as a column? Why don't we just always write it as a row? It's, you know, it takes up less space. So the re kind of the reason here is that actually, um, when you go on to do matrix multiplications, uh, the, the column actually has sort of a distinct uh, operation to the, to the row vector. So actually the conjugate vector is the guy that is, uh, like a, like a row vector where it is um, sort of laying along the horizontal. And in this case, the uh, components are actually uh, have this uh, kind of complex conjugate. So um, as I was saying, this thing actually can be, uh, you know, it basically is its own kind of vector space. It's, uh, uh, it, it, you can build any kind of conjugate vector. It's, it's like, you know, it's like a parallel universe of the, um, of, of the vectors. So there's like this whole conjugate vector space where uh, these guys are you know, sort of independent of each other. Um, and um, it's like the sort of a mirror world where everything is uh, the complex conjugate of uh, the original world. This is basically the uh, real reason why we want to introduce these uh, conjugate vectors. So, um, you know, just defining some vectors in a parallel universe uh, is not uh, really, there's not a lot of point to that. But uh, the, the point is, is that uh, what you can do uh, with these conjugate vectors is this gives like a new operation where you can turn two vectors uh, into a scalar number, right? So this is sort of something like multiplying um, two vectors in a way. Um, it's uh, a lot like the, the dot product. So if you're familiar with the with the with the dot product, then um, you might remember something like this. Say you've got like two vectors a and b then uh, the so-called dot product, if you've seen it before, uh, would be like the, the number which is made of the, the sum of the product of all the components. So A2, B2, uh, dot, 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 all the way to A, N, B, N. So this 
a inner product quantity, which we write uh, like this, um, where we take one of these conjugate vectors and then one of these uh, actual uh, vectors, theta, and then we uh, put them together and um, this is sort of a bit like Lego where they sort of fit into each other and the result of that gives uh, just a regular number, right? And this, uh, uh, this number is calculated by adding all the components um, to it uh, of the uh, conjugate vector and, and the vector and, and the regular vector. So um, this obviously has, you know, looks exactly like the uh, rule for the dot product. The only thing that is missing is there's no like, there's no stars here. So when we define the dot product, uh, there was no stars that we um, defined on, on the A. Um, and so this is where it's uh, slightly different. But of course, if your A vector only contains real numbers, then, uh, you, you know, the, the, for real numbers, um, you know, uh, A star is actually equal to A, right? Or A1 star is equal to A. So, so uh, if, if you are only talking about vectors that are real, no imaginary components, then this would be exactly the same. Um, another way to write this, which kind of also makes, in a way, a lot more sense uh, if you're used to working with this kind of, um, you know, row and column notation. So remember how I said that the conjugate vector is like the row vector and the regular vector is like the column vector, then when you do multiplication of vectors, what you do is like, you know, you do that whole thing where you take the, the, the thing on the right and then you kind of like rotate it and then put it on the top and then you multiply it and then you add everything together. There's this, you know, matrix multiplication. Um, if you're not familiar with it, then we'll, we'll go over it in the next slide uh, or so. But um, uh, when you do that operation, this exactly gives this, uh, this sum here. So either way, it's like kind of a way of, um, are taking two vectors and uh, turning it into the number. Okay, so that's just a mathematical operation, but you know, you might go, well, okay, two vectors gives a number, okay, I mean, I could do that in any way, you know, infinite number of ways, why, why do I want to choose this particular formula? Well, it turns out that this uh, formula is, um, uh, has some, very uh, nice properties, which uh, makes it in turn something which uh, relates to something kind of physical, right? Uh, and so the interpretation of basically what this number is, is it's like how similar the two vectors are. So for example, um, if you take two vectors and they are like orthogonal, they're like at right angles to each other, then you get always um, uh, the number zero. And in fact, uh, this thing is kind of a measure of the, the similarity of uh, two vectors. Um, and because in general, this uh, inner product, which is this, this number, um, is a complex number um, and, you know, it's difficult to sort of uh, have an intuitive grasp of, you know, what a complex number, that particular complex number is. But if you take the uh, mod squared of this or the uh, absolute value squared of it, then this gives you sort of a, um, a number which tells you how similar these um, uh, these two vectors are. And, and we'll be using this a lot in quantum mechanics uh, and it's kind of, uh, uh, used in context like, you know, say your quantum computer tried to create a state uh, that was, you know, some particular quantum state, uh, but it couldn't do it perfectly. It could, you know, only make the vector which was kind of similar to it, but not quite. Uh, people talk about the fidelity of the 
quantum operation, meaning like there's kind of the intended vector that you were supposed to get versus uh, what you actually got in the lab. And then, you know, fidelity of say 99% means that, uh, you, you know, the experimentalists have done a really good job. Right? What happens actually if you take the inner product with itself, um, uh, you get basically an expression that looks like this. So remember this uh, absolute value um, squared, what that actually means is like, so A times by A conjugate. And if you go back to the lectures last time, um, the key one of the key properties of this thing is that this is always a real number. So there's no complex component to, uh, to this. Uh, the uh, absolute value squared, meaning A times A star, uh, is, is always real. So this means that if you take the uh, inner product of a vector with itself, then you will get a sum of some uh, numbers, which are all going to be real numbers. And uh, that means that also this will be a real number. And of course, the square of a number, or the square modulus of a number, is also not only just re real, it's actually also always positive, or it could be zero, but um, basically it cannot be negative. Right? So this means, and this thing will always be equal to, uh, some real number which is also positive. So uh, that means that we can take the square root of uh, this number and uh, if you take the square root of this thing, this looks kind of a lot like uh, something that you are probably very used to, which is um, Pythagoras's rule. So for example, um, here's our vector uh, A alpha and uh, if you have the components a1 and a2, those are the you know positions on the coordinates, and you calculate this inner product alpha with with itself, then what you will get is uh, a1 squared plus uh, a2 squared, and a1 squared plus a2 squared is nothing but the length of this uh, of this triangle uh, triangle side. Um, or the hypotenuse of this triangle, and so, uh, well, sorry, the square root of that is is equal to the length of the uh, the long side of this triangle. So uh, basically, what this gives is like the square root of the inner product of the vector of itself will actually give the the length of the vector itself. And as I was sort of saying, uh, this thing. Uh, if you take the inner product and if you have, if you use the basis vectors, then uh, you will actually always get values which are either uh, one or zero. So uh, this chronica delta is defined as like, this is uh, equal to one if i is equal to j and equal to zero if i is uh, not equal to j. So if you take e1, so e1 in a product with itself, then because I've defined this thing as something of length one, this will be equal to one because uh, the, well, okay, so this thing is the length squared actually, but one squared is still one. So uh, the length of this uh, e1 vector is always one. Same with E2, but if you take the E1 and E2 in a product, then you, you will get zero, and the reason why is because they are orthogonal to each other. Okay, so uh, so uh, this this gives the uh, idea of the norm of a vector, and in fact, you can also uh, get the components of a vector. So 
this is like the component in the ith direction by also taking the uh, inner product of the vector with uh, the uh, the uh, the unit vector and the way that this works out and you can use this relation so uh, so I'll just do a kind of a simple two-dimensional example here so so if we've got like alpha is equal to a1 times e1 plus a2 times e2 and now say I do e1 in a product with alpha then what happens I've got e1 with the e1 in a product with with itself and then this is a2 with whoops um, I meant to write e e1 in a product with e2 now uh, if we use this relation here then the e1 e2 overlap is zero because they're orthogonal to each other e1 in a product with itself is just one and so this thing here is just equal to a1 okay. so by taking the inner product of the vector with the component uh, sorry the, with the basis vector then you can actually get the component so that's that's basically how that that part works um, so finally we can also uh, take a vector which um, does not have length one and always turn it into a vector that has uh, a length one basically by just dividing uh, the, the, the vector by the, um, the uh, square root of its, uh, of its length. Right? So you can actually just verify that uh, basically what you're doing here is you're taking the vector and then you're dividing it by its length because this is the length right then if you divide the vector by its own length remember this is a scalar on the bottom here then of course you get a vector which is like of length one right so uh, you can work out that if you take the inner product of this new normalized this is what you call normalization um, then you can get a vector which has a length uh, of one. So let's do a couple of these example questions so that you can get the feel of it. So firstly, let's find the inner product of alpha and beta when I've defined alpha and beta in this way. So firstly, we need to um, uh, write what the conjugate vector of alpha is. So, um, so if you write conjugate of alpha, Remember, the rule is just that you need to uh, turn all these numbers into the complex conjugate. So these numbers here need to take the complex conjugate, and you also need to make the basis vectors uh, complex, uh, sorry, the conjugate versions. So the i picks up an extra minus sign because that's what happens in conjugation, and, uh, and all the basis vectors are now conjugate. Okay, so then we can actually work out what this uh, inner product is. So the way that we can do it is just, just by substituting these values. So E1 uh, conjugate vector, E2 conjugate vector, and then we've got the beta vector here. So this is 1 minus I. So this one is just you write it just as is. And then what you can do is you can just multiply this uh, expression out. And uh, the thing that simplifies everything a lot is that anything that is orthogonal, so E1 and E2, uh, is going to be equal to zero. So pairs in this multiplication like like e1 and e2 this one is just going to be equal to zero and similarly with uh, this pair here that's also equal to zero so we don't have to actually think about those ones so 
immediately uh, forget about those ones. Uh, the ones which will not be zero are the pairs which are like E1 and the other E1, and uh, and that will give two uh, one minus i, so E1 uh, and E1, and then E2 with the other E2 will give minus i times one, so this will be E2 and E2. Uh, and remember, these guys are all length one, so this is one. So what we're just going to get is uh, the number two minus i, that's from the first part, minus i, that's from here, and you get two minus two i. Yeah. So that's that's the uh, inner product of um, of alpha and beta. So now let's try the other other question. So normalizing uh, 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 alpha vector. So first we need to find what is the the norm of the vector. So the norm of uh, alpha vector is um, so this is alpha in a product with itself square root. So that's just on the previous slide. So we need to work out what this guy is. So, um, so we can just follow the same procedure. So let's draw the square root sign. So two, and we've already worked out what the conjugate vector here is, over here. So uh, just substitute that in there. And we put in the original alpha vector. Okay, and then we can just multiply everything out and remember all these crosses between E1 and E2 are all going to be zero. So I don't have to worry about any of those. So the only terms that I'm going to get are this guy and this pair here. So two times two is four. And minus i times plus i is one. So, and okay, my square root sign was a bit too big there. So the answer here is square root of five. So that, that's my final answer there. So uh, that's the, the length uh, of um, the vector. And to normalize alpha, all I need to do is, okay, I ran out of space here, so I'm going to go up here. So the normalized version of alpha, which I'm going to call alpha prime, is just that vector divided by the length, square root of five. So in a way, that's that's good enough, but if you like, we can write it out in terms of all the components. So you just have to substitute the uh, definitions uh, of alpha there. And so this will be uh, one over root five uh, of E2. So that's, that's our um, normalized version of alpha. Let's uh, maybe finish up by just talking a little bit about um, operators. So um, we've talked about addition, multiplication of vectors in the uh, inner product, but uh, a more general type of uh, kind of uh, operation that you can do on vectors um, are operators. Right? So for example, if you take uh, some alpha here, and you turn it into some other vector, we can describe that process of turning one vector into another vector as uh, some kind of operation that is done on the vector. Right? And uh, what we will actually often use in quantum mechanics are so-called linear operations. And basically what this means is that these are operations such that when you operate, so here the T is our operator, uh, and you have like a sum of vectors, then it's actually equivalent to doing the operations on each of the states themselves, uh, multiplied by whatever the scalar factors originally were. So um, the way that I like to think about these operators 
is that they really are some kind of machine that takes like one vector and turns it into another vector. So imagine you've got you know some kind of uh, box, and you, what you can do is you can like feed it vectors on one end, and so basically this machine just crunches it and does some things with it, uh, and then at the end of that process, out comes like a new vector, uh, which uh, might be a, a different type of vector. So this operator is just some kind of you know, vector crunching machine that uh, does some kind of operation. And so uh, a particular example of this, um, so here I've just drawn a sort of a fairly regular uh, kind of random example here. So here's our initial vector, here's our final vector. And so this T operation basically takes it from the initial uh, to the final vector. Um, and what it looks like here is that it's done some kind of rotation and it's kind of elongated a little bit, so it's um, it's a, a kind of a combined rotator and um, you know magnifier. Um, but uh, so any kind of operation that's uh, that's um, uh, uh, like rotations or even uh, kind of reflections, these are all examples of um, some kind of operations. If we want to write uh, operators actually in terms of that kind of coordinate language, then uh, what it turns out to be equivalent to in terms of these linear operators uh, are actually matrices. Right? So um, we could uh, equally write our operator T here uh, in terms of a matrix and we could uh, basically do the equivalent operation of say you know this is the equation that says uh, we take an alpha uh, vector alpha we apply some operator t on it and it turns into some new vector um, alpha prime right so we can actually do exactly that same type of operation in terms of uh, matrices right so for example here here's our original vector which were the the components of alpha, so a1, a2, up to an, and um, then now t is going to act on it and it's going to change the vector in some way. The new alpha vector uh, is of course, you know, has some uh, kind of vector structure and uh, in general a linear operator can be basically written in terms of this matrix. Right? Um, so how do we do that matrix or how do we uh, perform that transformation? Then uh, what basically this equation is saying is that all you have to do is to perform the matrix multiplication uh, and uh, you can end up with the new vector. So uh, just to give you a simple example of matrix multiplication. So, so for example, let's say our T operator was something like this. So T was equal to say, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, okay, and we can just use our um, uh, sort of generic vector here, A, so this is A1 and A2. So if you want to multiply T and A together, then uh, what you do is the kind of matrix multiplication steps, and uh, in terms of matrix multiplication, what you do is like you you take this, like what, what I, I always like to uh, do when I'm doing this matrix multiplication, I just imagine taking this vector here and then like kind of putting it, sort of lying it across the top here, A1, A2, and then what I do is like multiply each of these pairs together. So what I get, so I multiply them and then add them, right? So the, the first component is going to be A1 times 0 plus A2 times 1, which is equal to A2. Okay. Uh, now we do the next uh, row where I multiply uh, again the, the original vector with the, um, uh, the elements of the T matrix. So here it would be A1 times 1 plus a2 times 0, so this will be a1. So what you can see happen here is that I've taken this vector a1, a2, 
and then I've ended up with the vector a two a one. So I've, I've I've flipped the uh, coordinates or components of uh, of the you know of the of the first, of the e one and the e two. So I've, I've kind of interchanged them. So this t here is uh, an example of a particular operations that you that you can do, but depending upon the uh, numbers that you put inside this matrix, of course, this will give all kinds of different uh, operations. Right? So that that's basically just a simple example of what this equation is talking about. And uh, this is an explicit formula that tells you what the components, the new components here are. So in this case, this thing would be equal to a one prime. This is equal to a two prime. So a one prime for example, is equal to, so A1 prime is equal to like T11A1 plus T12 times A2. So this is just a notation to, to, to say that, that fact, um, which we basically did uh, in when we're doing this example here. So um, the elements of this matrix, uh, so say we had somehow this T thing and we wanted to work out what the matrix version is. Um, remember, uh, if you wanted to work out the components, this, this was a few slides ago, uh, all we did was something like multiply the basis vector by uh, like E, sorry, EI with the vector in question, alpha. So you do something very similar with matrices if you want to work out all the matrix elements then Tij, because this time it's like a two-dimensional thing, right? Uh, you have like E1, and then T, and then Ej. And then that gives you basically the matrix elements. Or you could even re reconstruct the original T from the matrix elements by uh, using these coefficients and uh, using this um, outer product structure, which, which is on the next slide. This brings me to the outer product. So uh, previously we had, of course, the inner product, and this is where we had two vectors, and then we take uh, uh, the first to be the conjugate vector, uh, and the second to be the regular vector. And this, as you recall, always gives uh, some kind of um, scalar, right? So, sorry, scalar. So it gives uh, some number. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to take the regular vector alpha, and then second, we have the conjugate vector of, of say, beta. And what this actually gives is uh, a matrix. And to see why uh, these two things uh, are so different, um, it's actually easiest to see this in terms of, again, the matrix component notation. So if you have, uh, say, this alpha and beta uh, um, vector and conjugate vectors, and we write it in terms of uh, the components, then, okay, so the regular vector is like a column vector, but the uh, conjugate uh, vector is actually a row vector with uh, complex conjugates uh, inside. And if we actually do the matrix multiplication, you'll notice that this is sort of the, the, the other way around to the, to the inner product that we had before, right? So it's the other ordering, right? So this means that we can't just do the multiplication. Uh, we don't just get a single number. In fact, uh, we, when you do the multiplication, you need to take like each uh, column of this, and multiply it with the row. So actually you get uh, uh, dimension of, um, sorry, the uh, new matrix with uh, the dimension, which is like this is uh, an n by n matrix where n is the number of elements uh, in uh, alpha or beta. Okay, so this is the so-called outer product. And uh, this is basically most useful when you are talking about, again, Operators. I mean, in fact, this is this is a type of operator. It's a S S. This is a it gives a particular operator. And um, another type of simple example is if you take 
the outer product of two uh, basis or unit vectors. Uh, in this case, again, you get uh, just uh, uh, you know the matrix where it's the um, product of all the different combinations. And in fact, in this case, when only one of the components is uh, non-zero, then you'll only get some value, uh, non-zero value at the the coordinate um, specified by this. So basically, at the one uh, comma three element, you'll get something that's non-zero, and everything else will be zero if you take two unit vectors. And this is this is why we can expand our matrix in terms of uh, these outer products because basically each of the ij's just specifies some some uh, matrix element of this matrix and this is just whatever that coefficient is. So let's just finish off with uh, doing uh, one question here. So here what we're going to be doing is we're going to be multiplying matrices and vectors together. So let's first do number one. So I've got this uh, matrix called Z. Actually this type of matrix will come up over and over again with uh, what we'll be doing later. So it's good to be getting used to some of this uh, kind of matrix algebra. And what we'll want to do is we're going to be multiplying Z by uh, this particular vector, which is uh, 1, 1 over the square root of 2. Okay. So this thing is equal to, we just basically just go ahead and do the matrix multiplication. Basically, all there is to it. Um, so we've got, uh, that's just substituting the definitions into the, into the matrix. And then what we do again is, you know, what I mentally do is I bring that up here and then I've got the two numbers like one, one here. And then I just do the uh, multiplication uh, of each pairwise element and then I add them together. So this first one will be basically, uh, well firstly this scalar factor of 1 over root 2 can just sit out the front here and then the rest of it is like uh, 1 times 1 is 1 and 1 times 0 is 0 so it's 1 plus 0. This second row will be 1 times 0 which is 0, 1 times minus 1 which is minus 1 the answer of this one will be just simply um, uh, 1 uh, minus 1. Okay. Um, now it says use the above result to find beta z alpha. So because we've actually worked this part of it all out, so uh, all we really need to do is to, um, so look, we, what we can do is just, just for the sake of explanation, I can just define uh, gamma to be z uh, operating on alpha and so this gives this vector which we just worked out in part one and what we want to work out according to that is basically this thing beta uh, gamma so firstly we need to work out remember this is the conjugate vector of, of beta so uh, this is actually corresponding to a row vector. Okay, so the, actually everything here is real. So we don't have to really worry about taking complex conjugates here. So all we have to do is just tip it on its side. And that's our conjugate vector. And then gamma is just what we worked out. So I've written it a few times here already. Okay, and these scalar factors we can always just multiply out first. And then now we just do our uh, uh, matrix multiplication. So we multiply that element with that element that gives uh, uh, one and that element with that element that gives minus one, minus one times one, sorry, minus one times minus one is plus one. So finally, the answer is 1 plus 1 divided by 2. And so that's 2 divided by 2, and that's equal to 1. So in this case, it's equal to, to 1. OK, so I think uh, we will leave it there for this week and finish off this uh, for uh, the next lecture. Um, so as usual, I have uploaded the homework questions 
uh, on NYU classes. So please have a look at that and um, and hand them in uh, the, the, the following week. And um, if there are any questions, then we can discuss it uh, uh, during our regular um, uh, session times. So, okay, so um, uh, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to contact me and otherwise um, uh, see you next week.